Hello, Philadelphia. It is great to be back at the Fillmore with all of you. A city that dared to ask the question, what's the opposite of Southern hospitality? <laughs> and I love it. Let's get into it. What a week. The White House has formally announced that the president will not pardon Hunter Biden after he pleaded guilty to gun and tax related charges. Biden, however, did announce that until his behavioral issue subsides, Hunter will be sent to live with relatives on a farm in Delaware. <laughs> Recent polls show Senator Tim Scott gaining ground in the Republican primary, narrowing the gap with a Zoom that asked to be a real boy named Ron DeSantis. Good things come to those who wait, remarked Scott, while blocking another loose woman on hinge who suggested holding hands. <laughs> the DOJ charged future ankle monitor disliker Donald Trump with new counts of mishandling classified documents. Mar-a-Lago's head of maintenance, Carlos de Oliveira, and Trump aide Walt Nauta also received new charges, and according to the filing, can be seen on security camera footage moving boxes of classified documents around. I imagine it's hard to run a shadowy operation when you exclusively hire guys who were kicked out of the Three Stooges for being too all over the place. <laughs> Justice Samuel Alito told the Wall Street Journal that Congress should not be policing the Supreme Court. Here's what he said. I know this is a controversial view, but I'm willing to say it. No provision of the Constitution gives them the authority to regulate the Supreme Court, period. The guy's obsessed with periods. Uh, <laughs> Only I am brave enough to tell it like it is. Nothing in the employee manual stops me from pissing in the office's ice machine. <laughs> Members of the House of Representatives began their August recess this week, despite not resolving a major spending disagreement between the two parties that could force a government shutdown. Oh, like you got a ton of stuff done the last week of July. <laughs> the last week of July is about giving up, going to the beach, and disappointing the people who depend on you. I, for one, feel well represented. <laughs> Republican lawmaker Derek Van Orden is under fire after teenage Senate pages accused him of berating and swearing at them, calling them jackasses and pieces of shit. Van Orden reportedly felt the teens were disrespecting the space of the Capitol Rotunda. This is going to be an unpopular take, but I stand with Representative Van Orden. <laughs> Do you know how brave you have to be to call out a group of teens who are loitering? The ones at my 7-Eleven said I had no drip and I have not been back in months. <laughs> no drip at all? Not even a little drip? <laughs> Somehow, as impossible as it may seem, we are learning about new George Santos scams. <laughs> this is incredible. According to the New York Times, in addition to other shady deals, Santos actually tried to run a version of the classic Nigerian prince scam on one of his wealthy donors. He claimed that a rich Polish citizen couldn't access his funds to buy crypto. Police caught on when the fictional Polish millionaire mentioned only needing one person to change a light bulb, while neglecting to mention that the other two that would be required to turn the ladder. We, I know, I know. Hey, can we make Polish jokes in the year 2023? Brian, consult the Jokatron 5000. Oh, it exploded backstage? I couldn't get through that one. Turn the ladder. Right-wing propaganda outlet PragerU said Florida had approved their PragerU kids material for use in classrooms. Before everyone freaks out, some of this actually looks pretty straightforward. If a caravan is heading towards the southern border at four miles per hour and <laughs> patriots are building Donald Trump's magnificent wall at a rate of seven feet per day, why does Joe Biden deserve the death? Okay. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> The PragerU kids material is just slaughterhouse safety videos with a voiceover that occasionally mentions the Jews. So it's not that different from the previous curriculum, but still, alarming. 
An 11-year-old girl in Florida was arrested and charged with a felony after making a fake 911 call on a dare, claiming that an armed man kidnapped her friend. Said Sheriff Mike Chitwood, this kind of prank activity is dangerous and it wasted valuable resources. The officer then jumped into his armored amphibious combat vehicle and drove home to pack for the annual retreat. A city septa trolley derailed and crashed into a historic home in southwest Philly on Thursday night. City officials said that the rail operator could have stopped it, but he was paralyzed, unsure whether or not it was morally justified to divert the trolley <laughs> into a less historic home. <laughs> the incident marks the fifth septa crash in a week, and there's nothing left to do except to laugh and say, that's Philly. Uh, the Houston Independent School District announced a plan to close at least 28 school libraries. Under the plan, the school district will fire the librarians and turn the libraries into discipline centers for children removed from class. The books will remain in the library spaces using an honor system. They're calling it prison. <laughs> Did I do that voice again? I think it, was, it wasn't different enough. They're calling it prison. <laughs> They're calling it. <clears throat> They're calling it prison. Maybe my normal voice has gotten too much like a newscaster. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Country music star and future Donald Trump handshaker Jason Aldean ran off stage mid-song and canceled the rest of the concert after reportedly experiencing heat stroke. Hey Jason, here's something you can try in a small town. Drinking water. El Nino and other ongoing weather crises are reportedly causing a sugar shortage, which will likely affect candy companies' ability to produce candy for Halloween. This Halloween is brought to you by little boxes of raisins. <laughs> raisins are nature's candy, until you try candy. We all hated getting these little boxes because we knew about candy. But in a world without candy, raisins are candy again. And pennies, like for the little UNICEF box? Is that what you mean? They're... Yeah, that's what I, yeah, pennies. That's what I said, but it was a UNICEF box thing. When I was a kid, do you guys have the UNICEF box? But, they, but it was supplemental. You didn't just walk around with the UNICEF box. You had the UNICEF box and you had the little bucket. Yeah. What? It's a New York thing? The... Apparently not. <laughs> Scientists are baffled by a mysterious object in space that has been lighting up every 20 minutes for over three decades. One researcher was heard to remark, what is this thing, Seth Rogen? <laughs> Two species of roundworms that had been frozen in permafrost were revived by scientists and dated to be about 46,000 years old. Honey, guess what I did at work today, said the worm scientist jubilantly to no one returning to his empty, empty home. <laughs> But these worms look incredible. If anyone has a permafrost guy in LA, let me know. <laughs> the lead scientist told reporters, now we've got to get these ancient worms back to Congress. <laughs> in, in another study, scientists were able to extend the lives of old mice by connecting their blood vessels to younger mice. Oh, interesting, said Mitch McConnell after 30... <laughs> 30 silent seconds standing between a terrified intern and the only exit. <laughs> and finally, Trader Joe's issued a recall for their unexpected broccoli cheddar soup after it was unexpectedly discovered to contain insects. What? Girls can have girl dinner, but boys can't have boy dinner? Have any of President Joe Biden's dogs ever bitten you? <laughs> Have you gotten, gotten the business from major, commander, general? Or... I've, I've, I've neither been bitten or humped by any of Joe Biden's dogs. Don't you think that should become almost like a rite of passage? Like, 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 like is this person, does, it, does this, is this person work, cl work closely with the White House? Uh, let's just say uh, he's been bitten by major, you know? <laughs> 
Pennsylvania and Delaware, a piece as fragile as any on earth. The simmering resentments between these mortal enemies always but one spark, one ember from a roiling boil. In Philadelphia schools each morning, children say the Pledge of Allegiance and the pledge to seek the return of the Wedge, a one-mile tract of disputed territory currently occupied by Delaware, <laughs> that the simple people of this region, that the simple people of this region with their jerseys and hand food <laughs> and fascinating culture of rudeness claim has historical, if not spiritual, significance. Here to bridge the divide, but please welcome to the stage, it's Delaware State Center and hopefully the state's future Congresswoman, Sarah McBride. Thanks for being here. Now, first question. Um, obviously, uh, the, the, the line, the Delaware, Pen Maryland, Pennsylvania line has been, hasn't moved very much since 1921. Um, but in a, here in front of the people of Pennsylvania, can you at all, can even consider the return of the wedge? The wedge is one of the most pristine parts of the great state of Delaware, and we will never, ever give it up. And we don't have much land to lose, so <laughs> we gotta keep all we can. That's smart, that's politics. Um, how's the campaign trail been so far? It's been great. Uh, I announced about a month ago for the open congressional seat in Delaware. Uh, and for those who don't know, if I'm elected, I'll be the first openly transgender member of Congress. <laughs> And Republican. And Republican, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We've got, I think, much of the state of Delaware here this evening, so. No one is left in the state right now. Um, but it's been fantastic. The support that has come in, the, the folks who have visited sarahmcbride.com to donate and volunteer to make sure that we are reaching as many voters as possible and doing what has never been done before uh, and making sure that all of the voices are heard in Congress. It's been an overwhelming experience, um, an energizing experience, and uh, I'm excited for the next year to get my message out there about Delaware needing a member of Congress who's gonna be effective and thoughtful in delivering real results on all of the issues that matter to Delawareans. So you're campaigning on, on healthcare, on paid leave, uh, what is an issue that's actually surprised you that you've been asked about that people might not expect? Well, I think one of the things that, that I often get asked is, are people ready to elect someone like you to Congress? And I think one of the, the facts that I have seen throughout my political career is that voters are fair-minded. They are looking at a candidate's ideas, not their identity. They're more concerned with who can deliver for them than they are a candidate's gender. And I think that's one of the things that right now in this moment, it's easy to, to feel despondent, it's easy to feel hopeless, it's easy to feel cynical. But running for office in 2020 and now running for the US Congress, I think for me one of the things that inspires me the most is that when I see voters, they see me as a multi-dimensional human being um, and they want to talk about the issues, they don't want to talk about my identity. So, uh, and one of the issues you have been focusing on is protecting access to healthcare and ways we can uh, improve the healthcare system in part because you've had a really personal, you've been affected really personally by the healthcare system. Can you talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind, and how it influences the policies you think we need? Sure, well, I am running for Congress not just as a lifelong Delawarean, not just as a sitting member of the Delaware State Senate, but also as someone who served as a caregiver to my husband, Andy, during his battle with cancer. Um, Andy was diagnosed with cancer about a year into our relationship. He was about 25 at the time. I was 23, just out of college. And when he heard that word that everyone fears cancer, um, our hearts sunk and it felt like the world was coming in on us. But throughout his battle with cancer, Andy always considered himself lucky. He was lucky to have health insurance. 
We were both lucky to have flexible workplace policies that allowed him to focus on the full-time job of trying to get better and me to focus on the full-time job of being there to, to care for him, to love him, and to support him, and ultimately to be there to marry him just four days before he passed away. And the thing about Andy is that up until his last breath, he always considered himself lucky. And I don't believe having health insurance, I don't believe having access to paid family and medical leave should be a matter of luck. I believe it should be the law of the land. And that's why in, in the Delaware State Senate, I've championed health care reform and not only introduced, but passed in my first term, paid family and medical leave, the largest expansion of the so social safety net in modern state history in Delaware, because those basic support structures, that little bit of breathing, breathing room during inevitable life challenges, that should be a reality for every person, regardless of where they live and regardless of what job they have. One thing I wanted to ask you about, so in April, the Biden administration proposed a rule uh, that would forbid bans of trans athletes from playing sports that match their gender identities, so these blanket bans, um, but would still allow schools in some cases to block individual athletes depending on the sport and the level of competition. This was seen by some people as a way to stop these big blanket bans, sort of to, to fight back against some of these more conservative governors and state legislatures. Others saw it as a, like a tr really troubling concession. Uh, to a right-wing argument, and then there was a kind of a third group that thought it was in some way shrewd because it recognized that that Republicans feel like this is uh, that that sports is a place where they want to have this debate. Um, what was your reaction to it, uh, both as somebody who is trans, but also as someone who has been a communicator for a gay rights organization and and is thinking about the policies? Sure. Well, well, first off, as a Delawarean, we all are dated, mated, or related. So I have, <laughs> I have like every Delawarean, the, the privilege of knowing Joe Biden. And <laughs> I, I have seen his commitment to trans rights up close. I've seen his passion. I've seen um, his, his understanding of these issues. Um, and I think on that proposed rule, the most important thing is that it would very clearly declare that the types of anti-trans policies that Republican governors and Republican legislatures across the country are, that they're pushing, that those policies are illegal, that those policies are a violation of federal law. Now, there's certainly room for improvement in the rule. I believe that as a trans person. Um, but I think it's important for us to recognize that Republicans have honed in on this particular issue because they believe that it'll help to divide progressives, it'll help to divide the Democratic Party, uh, and it'll alienate some folks who might otherwise be with us on trans rights on practically every other issue, but have some concerns here. And I think what's really important is as we work with the Biden administration to make sure that it's the most robust rule possible that can withstand this packed right-wing court, that we reinforce our folks that these attacks that we're seeing from sports to healthcare, to book bans are an effort by Republican politicians to distract from the fact that they have absolutely no policy proposals to meet the needs of workers and families in this country. And so we should defend the rights of a community I'm proud to be a part of with every breath but we should also never lose sight of the fact that this is part of an ongoing strategy by right-wing politicians to divide and conquer. They've focused on different marginalized communities in the past, today they're focused on trans people, and so we have to stand united. And I believe that as we saw in 2022, that these types of attacks will ring hollow with voters in 2024. They don't speak to what's actually keeping people up at night. And of course, on top of that, we know they don't wear well in history. Have any of President Joe Biden's dogs ever bitten you? <laughs> Have you gotten, gotten the business from major, commander, general? Or? I've, I've, I've neither been bitten or humped by any of Joe Biden's dogs. 
Don't you think that should become almost like a rite of passage? Like, 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 is this person does it? Does this is this person work cl- work closely with the White House? Uh, let's just say uh, he's been bitten by Major. You know. <laughs> I think yeah, that'd I think be that's cool. fair. I think that's fair. Sarah, I'm not going to lie. I didn't know much about Delaware. I'm sorry. Some might say I still don't. <laughs> but tonight, we thought we'd all learn a little bit about... Um, the Del- greatest state in the union? The, gra- the greatest... <laughs> Just... What did you think I was... What did you project onto me? What a fascinating thing. I said nothing and you screamed, don't say it. It? What? That it's the, the tax haven thing? All right. Be careful. We've got uh, Joe Biden's dogs here. If yeah, you Joe say Biden's anything, dogs are here. If you say anything insulting. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> All right. It's time for a game we're calling Cellaware. <laughs> Delaware is actually the first state. That's right. Pennsylvania, this pit full of gritty eggs, was second. How many days... <laughs> how many days before Pennsylvania did Delaware unanimously vote to ratify the U.S. Constitution? Five? It was actually just a few hours. One or seven? Oh, God. Nothing matters after Delaware ratified the Constitution. But I'll guess B. No, it was five days. It was five days. But it's good not to know. Nobody nobody cares how long it took you to come in second. That's right. How did Delaware get the nickname the Diamond State? Is it A, because like diamonds, it will live forever. B... It was the first state where settlers found precious gems, but not diamonds. C, Thomas Jefferson called it a jewel among the states. Or D, King George used it as a storehouse for about a third of the crown jewels. I believe that... Don't give me the answers. Let me get it myself. C. It is. It is Thomas Jefferson. I did know that one. I promise Uh, I knew that one. However, I will say uh, Monticello.org says, this exact quotation has not been found in any of the writings of Thomas Jefferson. (laughs) So, how many feet above sea level is Delaware's highest point? I believe. 200, 380, 450, or 16,000. What kind of mountain would that be? Jesus. I don't remember that. Did you? Yeah, I was going to say, you you rounded up here because I thought it was like 433 or something. 450, see? You got it. Yes! Specifically, 447. 0.85 0.85 feet. Okay. Yeah, nice. Uh, we have like a nice, nice little stone. It's by a parking lot. It's, it's like a slight incline from a <laughs> road with a mall on it. It's beautiful. Is, it a vis- is there a vista? No, no vista. No vista. No vista. Leonard Mall ran a bait and tackle shop in Lewes, Delaware. Is it how you say Lewes? Lewis. Lewis. We've got okay. some Delaware beach people here. They know what they're talking about. He died in 2012. What is his last wish? A, that local newspapers describe his surviving wife as a tall drink of water. <laughs> B, that his beloved pet parrot Coco be sent to Costa Rica. C, that $10,000 be thrown out of a helicopter to rain money on the town of Lewis. Or C, oh, that was it. Or that, I cut the D. B, oh, I oh, I missed B, sorry. B, his children have a televised pillow fight to decide who'd win his inheritance. Or, or the other ones I've already said. This is made up. It, it, it isn't. I'm going to need an answer. You can help. You can ask the audience for help. A, uh, C. You C. got it. Did wait, every wait. answer C? Wait, no. Oh, so on my card you got. No, it, you're correct. It was D. Uh, <laughs> yes. 10,000 be thrown out of a helicopter. Okay. Wow. Which of the following is not a real place in Delaware? Slaughter Beach, Bear, Murder Kill River, or Horville? Whore Kill. Or E, they're all real. How do you say it? Whore Kill? Whore Kill or Horville? Whore Kill. kill. Murder Kill River. What the fuck? (laughs) Or E, they're all real. 
well, Slaughter Beach is definitely real. Bear is real. Murder Kill is real. Whore Kill? I, I don't think I've heard Whore Kill. E. You got it. It's e. all real. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> what? You got to stop by Whore Kill. <laughs> it's not an incorporated locality. Yeah, they're trying to stay under the radar. <laughs> All right, now listen, according, we, we've already covered this topic a bit, but according to the website DelawareToday.com, which we cannot verify, <laughs> what percentage of Delawareans have, a, have, have claimed to have met Joe Biden in person? Is it A, 10%, B, 15%, C, 25%, or D, 40%? D. You know, you'd think it would be, and C. it probably it is. It's C. It's twenty five percent. Yeah, yeah. forty quarter, seems too high. Forty seems too high. The audience was with D, so I was going with the people. How many people? Let's just on let's your do, voice. All right. How many people here tonight are from Delaware? That is really not that many. That's disappointing. How it is a schlep up here. Who you, who what? are you? You went to school together. Cab Calloway. Yeah, we've got actually Matt Marshall here, who also went to Cab Calloway. Cab Calloway School of the Arts. Nice. <laughs> now, sorry, remind me, how many people here are from Delaware? How many of you have met Joe Biden? That feels like 40%, I have to say. Did you have that one worked up behind the stage? <laughs> yeah. It was a good Delaware joke. Sure. In better news, the, la this, the ladybug is Delaware's official insect, which is queer culture. <laughs> Why the ladybug? Is it A, the same ladybug landed on the state's first governor three separate times? <laughs> These are tiny. B, a truck full of ladybugs tipped on the highway in 1963, closing a road. C, a random class of second graders in 1974 launched an aggressive campaign to make it so. Or D, this didn't actually happen. But the state lore is that Betsy Ross was incredibly insistent that the flag be flown at the Capitol, and the lieutenant governor at the time screamed, okay, lady, stop bugging me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm noticing a trend. I, so as a member of the legislature, uh, we often get lobbied by second graders who are advocating to change different things. So we just declared the rescue dog the state dog. Aww. Oh. Aww. Is, pa Very is pandering the state behavior? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll guess C. Okay. And you got it. Yes. All right. Uh, how can people help the campaign? For, well, I already mentioned it before, but I'll use a shameless plug again. SarahMcBride.com. We're trying to do something that no one has ever done in our history. So please visit it. Donate, volunteer, help us out. Thank you so much for being here, Sarah McBride. One more time. <laughs> 